Max, the one to watch for the best in entertainment, now has live sports with the Bleacher Report sports add-on. Stream hundreds of select live games from MLB. That's gonna go! NBA, NHL, U.S. soccer, and NCAA men's March Madness. And it's all included for a limited time with any Max subscription. He got it. After the promo period, add it for $9.99 a month. Base subscription required. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Some things are just better together. Like party playlists and Friday nights. Campfires and ghost stories. Peanut butter and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. City of Chronicles is a Bay of Chronicles production. <laughs> I was saying that I was driving down Earl's Court in um, in London and I was playing Una Estate Italia and there were some Italians walking around and then they just turned around and were like, ah! And they start screaming in the middle of the street, being like, yeah, fast, that's all he wants. And I was like, and you could see, obviously, like, we're in London, right? And so we did defeat England, you know? So there was like this whole thing and then they were like, you know, and then one of them starts crying because he was like, it was so emotional for them, you know? Oh, how sad to not have us on the world count. Anyway, Nikki, hello. Hi, I genuinely, I know I'm sort of down on the running order to just introduce this podcast. I think maybe that anecdote could just literally be un, unintroduced as the introduction to our pre-World Cup podcast because I love it. It sums up everything that is great about the World Cup to me, everything that makes the World Cup such a joy to me normally. Hi, everybody. If you're listening to this, I don't know if producer Simon's going to let us roll in like this, but I'm just going to do it and see if he lets us. <laughs> Nikki Bandini here um, with Nina Rizuki, as, as always on this podcast, but it's not our usual podcast. We are the co-hosts of Serie A Chronicles, but Serie A is on pause like all of European football right now. So this is going to be our little rebranded World Cup Chronicles podcast for the next few weeks. And um yeah, super interesting uh, place to start because I, I was going to jump right in off the top, Mina, and, and and talk about how we're feeling about this World Cup particularly. And and obviously, it's an Italian football podcast. We talk about Italian football most of the time. There's no Italy in it, and that has an impact on how we feel about it. But it's also a very particular podcast for for other reasons. And I was on um, Tim Vickery and Dot and Adebayo's um, show, The Brazil Shirt podcast um, recently and was talking about the many reasons why I feel really super conflicted about this World Cup. And um, yeah, I don't want to monologue on you, Mina. Um, monologue away. Chasing you properly. Um, it's, it is a really, it's a really complicated World Cup to know how to feel about it. I, I think like in the immediate sense, some of my way that I feel about this World Cup is literally just affected by the fact that it's happening. It's just a strange time. You know, I'm so my, my brain is still engaged in European club football mode and suddenly there's a World Cup and there's been no build up to it. Here we are. Here's the World Cup. It's in front of you. And I haven't had time to uh, sort of think about it that much. But when I do think about it, I, I, I do have these really conflicted feelings about this World Cup. And, and some of that, I think, is, is pretty obvious. Um, I'm a transgender woman and this is a World Cup happening in a place where 
I, if Italy had qualified, genuinely was wrestling with the question of would it be safe for me to go? Like if I was going to do my job to be a professional journalist who covers football at this World Cup, would it be safe? And I don't know the answer to that. And to be clear, I, I didn't know that with Russia in the last World Cup either. And, and both times Italy's failed to qualify. And I suppose I've, I've not had that question forced on me in a certain sense. But I then sort of starting from there, move very quickly onto the, the thought, well, I have the privilege of deciding whether or not to go. Whereas people who live in those countries don't have that privilege. And, and in those countries, there's all sorts of documented abuse and and certainly the the things that have been reported in, in recent weeks of, of how LGBT citizens are treated in Qatar has been horrifying. And, and so I find it really, really difficult to feel positively about a World Cup that brings attention to a country that is a cause celebration of a country normally. Normally when a World Cup is happening, you're watching, you're thinking, wow, it's like not just an insight into football, it's an insight into this culture, this different part of the world that's part of the experience of the World Cup. And that I feel really complicated feelings about. And then before we get to even any of that, we have the the greater, well, even more sort of challenging question, which is that these World Cup, there's been so many reports now, Human Rights Watch has covered extensively. We've had reports from The Guardian. We've had reports from all over about the working conditions of laborers in building these stadiums. We've had, um, it's very hard to get clear numbers on it, but pretty clear evidence that's come out that there's been mistreatment of workers, that there's been all sorts of sort of wage abuse of workers. But at the bluntest end of it, there have been people who've traveled from other countries to Qatar to try to work, have a job, send money back to their families, specifically in, in a lot of South Asian countries who haven't come home again. And that seems to come down to some horrendous working conditions and living conditions that they've been put into. And all of those things make me feel, make it feel very hard for me to lose myself in the football. Put it that way. I guess that's, that's, that's my starting feeling on this World Cup, Mina. And I'm sorry that was my big monologue as I pre-advised, but um, I don't know. How do you feel about this World Cup as, as we um, start, start to get into it? I mean, on, on the show that you were saying, it's like verbal, like you were vomiting um, or your, your feelings out there. And I just did it again. But I think that's kind of the only way to do it, if that makes sense. Because when you have something building inside of you and your feelings are overwhelming at that time, your only option is to do that. Because this is, I think it's kind of the state of play in general in the world at the moment, where I, I'm constantly on some sort of rant somewhere about something, you know, and, and you do feel like you don't know how to stop yourself from saying something because we are now a little bit more honest about ourselves and thankfully we live in a world in which we can speak. Does that mean that anything changes? I, I don't know. How do I feel about the World Cup? What I think is interesting about this is, is the way that you framed this before the show when you were asking me, you're like, I want to hear what Mina has to say because she, she, is, she does have Arabic roots, right? And I don't feel like many people have asked many Arabs about it in the media. And so I, I've kind of... I haven't heard Arab voice on it at all. Yeah. And I, and I think that there are so many Arabic journalists, like there's several in the Daily Mail, for example, you know, and yet I don't feel like any of them have been asked this question or, or any of my employees have thought, okay, well, what about you? What do you think of it? I'm, maybe because it's always sort of, I speak about Italian football, they just assume that's all I want to talk about, you know? So I did think that that was weird that they haven't gotten that. I feel like I've listened to a lot of podcasts in which I disagree with or haven't felt like they were accurate in the way that they talk about things. It's kind of a shame that when you do finally get a World Cup being staged in the Middle East, it is under these conditions. And these, this is what we are talking about, you know, for a country that is trying to build that its reputation. It's a, it's a shame that, and one that is hugely wealthy, right? And treats its would treat its laborers in such fashion. You know that the whole world will have their eyes on you. It becomes really complicated because here's the thing, right? You are against something, but at the same time, you feel like what you do get a lot of the time is sort of, oh, it's the, I don't know how to explain it in all honesty. You know, you live in the West, you know, you live in England. I'm raised in England. I work for Americans or I work for the English. I believe in Western ideals, but I am Arabic. And there does come a point where you do feel like it's really difficult to take things on board without feeling the hypocrisy of it, even if what they're saying is correct. It's this kind of thing where I don't know how to, 
to get over this like, oh, there's these poor women, you know, you, as, a, as, a, as an Arab woman yourself, Mina, how do, how do you feel about the way that, that women are treated in, in, in Middle East? And of course, it's like, well, firstly, the Middle East suffers, you know, is, is completely different. I mean, if you're a Moroccan, it is completely different to if you are Egyptian, to if you are uh, Lebanese, if you are Iraqi. And then you all sort of get the same thing. And, oh, you, you must suffer the same things as Qatari women. Well, Qatari women have land that all their bills are paid for. They are financially taken care of, you know, by everyone around them. They, the actual Qatari people are very happy in the sense that, you know, they are wealthy taken care of. They don't have a bill to pay. They never have to worry about things. Do they have their freedoms? I'm sure that that's their sacrifice. They don't have their freedoms. And sadly, this is something now that I didn't, obviously we have to, I have to do my research for this World Cup. And I still cannot believe that there are 69 nations in which homosexuality is criminalized. 69 nations. My question is, if I want to hold a World Cup, where would I choose to hold it? I, I don't know mm -hmm. because right now, how 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 can Qatar go ahead and do all of this to its laborers? How can it say that we're open to everyone and make it so clear it isn't? I've spoken to some people who tell me things that are very different. And then yesterday, I was listening to David Conn, and he did a podcast on BBC Sounds in which he brought on a Qatari man who is homosexual, who lives in, who living in the state as he sought asylum, and he spoke about the way that he is treated and how he feels that he is terrified of his family, of the conditions. And it was really difficult to listen to what he had to say, even though he was very upbeat and he was smiling and laughing. And then there was one point he broke down in the middle of the podcast. And you think, oh, this is, this is a horrible. And then I speak to other people who say, oh, no, don't believe any of these things. We're, we're fine. And, and, and now I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't, honestly, I don't know what to believe in any, any state. But I guess my bigger question in all of this is, where would I stage a World Cup? Like, is this a, a world, do we have a world problem? I only realized that 69 nations still criminalize homosexuality. Human rights is, is horrendous in nearly every country now. If we are going to stage a World mm -hmm. Cup, are we going to do so where? In England and USA? I, frankly, my father's Iraqi. It is an illegal invasion of Iraq. You have stripped a country of its natural resources. It was been described as an illegal invasion by UN and Kofi Annan. And yet it was done to line the pockets of Dick Cheney and, and Tony Blair, who was then knighted. I don't feel comfortable having that when we turn around to Russia and say, well, you can't do that, but we can. And our athletes don't suffer any mm -hmm. of the consequences. And we may, you know, prosecute and, and heavily be, uh, you know, our black population and need to be reminded that black lives matter, where women in certain states don't even have the right to an abortion, but a woman in downtown Baghdad can walk in and have one. So for me, those are questionable things. Why do they get to do it and we don't? Why is Russia not a, you know, why is Russia being told that you can't illegally invade someone? Because you can't, <laughs> but then they'd be allowed to too. So in my head, it's like, where would I stage this World Cup? Where? And this, and, and you know, and, and like the kafala system for the laborers in Qatar. Like, how is this allowed to change? And then there's a part of me that thinks, should we have these World Cups every four years? Because it does shed a light on some of these issues. Because now we are asking for things to change. Because they have implemented some laws to change that. Is it enough? Not by any stretch of the imagination. When you consider that nearly 7,000 laborers have died. And, and they still continue to, to be subjected to horrendous conditions because of the enormous heat. It's November, and I've just watched ESPN FC in which the, the, the guys are talking about how the fact that they're sweating through everything they're wearing and they're in T-shirts. And I, and I think to myself, they're still having to work in these conditions, and it's November. Imagine what it's like in the heat of summer. So I, I honestly don't know because there's a part of me that just feels at this moment in time that I don't want to... I feel like, you know, as an Arab, you think that everything's always like, oh, yes, but darling, you're not up to us. But then you still think, well, yeah, but the, the kafala system that everyone's complaining about, Qatar only sought independence from the UK in 1971. That was started and, and, and largely influenced by the English code. They had brought their British subjects along with them, which were South, South Asian, and they had wanted greater control over them, as David Conn explained in his podcast. And that is something that has continued in Qatar and become part of, part of Qatari rules and laws that is only being addressed now because of the World Cup. Should we have a World Cup in countries that need greater to shed a light on all their human rights issues? 
it should should it now be as an incentive to get us to change things in in the world? But honestly speaking, when I started to think about where I'd want this World Cup, I honestly couldn't come up with it with many countries that I would be like, yeah, that's okay. I'm all right with this country. I'm all right with that country. Because not even the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> interesting choice given Jack Warner, of course, and his exactly. role in the whole um, corrupt um, scenario we had. And also, again, if you're transgender, I mean, what, what the rules are there how much they've criminalized homosexuality as well in, in the likes of Jamaica and Barbados. Absolutely. So where, where would you do it? Where? No, and I, I, I do think that's, I think that's like a, a really sort of big question that, that I, um, first of all, just want to say thank you, Mina. Like, it's really interesting to hear you on that. Cause like, I, I feel like I've done my verbal diary and it was like nice to hear you sort of come back with all of, of your thoughts on it as well. And I, I, I do share like that feeling of, of, of discomfort about like, God, well, where, where are we going to find the perfect places to host? Cause there are problems everywhere. There are, and I'm not shy of that. And I think that's a really complicated question. I think I can't get past. And of course I come at this, I do, of course I come at this from, from who I am and, and, and my yeah. life experience and, 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 and my reality. And, but I, I can't get past the fact that we've now had two world cups in a row. Yeah, and it's a World Cup is is supposed to be something that is explicitly inclusive. I mean, it is explicitly about bringing the world together. FIFA sell that message every bloody World Cup. They hammer that message. It's the whole world. It's bring the world together. That's what it's for. It's supposed to be this freedom from politics. Ironically, this moment of let's just enjoy this thing that we all love together, football. And you've had two in a row in countries where LGBT plus people are not safe are not. And we are not the majority of the population, but actually we're a pretty chunky minority of the population. And you've had two in a row where explicitly, legally, we do not have safety. That's crazy to me. It's crazy that that's been allowed to happen. And, and, and I think it's, you know, it's hard for me to move, move beyond that. Yeah. How would I feel about this World Cup if Italy were in it? Differently, I'm sure. Like 100%. If I had like a, a team that I was excited about, yeah, I'll go watch my team. I'm sure I'd feel differently about it. But it wouldn't take that away. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change that, that side of things. And yeah, I'd, I don't know. I, it makes me sad because I, I love the World Cup. I love the idea of it so much. I guess because like when I was a kid, I really bought into that whole bringing the world together thing. And because I do love watching. I love that about the World Cup. I love when you're sort of watching a game between two countries whose football you don't normally watch. You know, if it's, I don't know why these two countries in my head, but say Japan and Ecuador. And I'm like, I don't normally watch the Japan national team. I don't (laughs) normally watch the Ecuadorian national team. But I'm watching them right now. And I'm thinking about people in Japan watching this game of football, people in Ecuador watching this game of football and how cool that is. It's people who are separated by everything in their lives. They have nothing in common except for this football match that's happening. And this football match is a shared common experience. And the World Cup, like nothing else, I mean, even even the Olympics barely compare. So the Olympics is, it's super interesting if you get into like this to be nerdy for a second. I remember when I was at the Guardian on staff there, they talked about Google Trends with us one time. And basically like they were showing us how the World Cup affects search traffic and nothing gets close to the World Cup for sustained interest. Like the Olympics causes like a similar high peak, but it's really short lived. Yeah. And maybe like the, the US presidential election as well causes like still not as high, but kind of close. The World Cup is, is like nothing else in the world in terms of the national, international interest and, and what it does to people. And I think that's cool. But isn't that kind of why you're a reporter? Like why you've chosen to be a sports yeah. journalist? Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, so let's, why don't we do that? We, we were going to go to talk about the teams um, next, but you know what I mean? Let's, let's, let's jump to that next. Cause I think like football and why we got into the world cup, let's turn it to that slightly happier angle. Yeah, we need that. The world cup, putting aside the specifics of this world cup, what does the world cup mean to you? Like, what was your first memories of the, of the world cup and, and like, yeah, what, what, what drew you to it? Mostly my family. Um, it was you know, in life you go through, like, we, are, obviously I come from like, I don't know, a hundred nations now altogether. If you see my DNA file, like, I think they, they had to put it on four different pages because it didn't fit. <laughs> um, but, um, 
the best moment that I have when I remember the World Cup is that the one thing that we do when the World Cup starts, the whole family gets together for all the big matches and most of them. My earliest memories is 94 because it was in the US and the time the times were different, right? So they were really late at night or, you know, obviously different for uh, when you were living in, in, in the UK. And I remember this because we had my sister staying with us. She was married at the time. I have two older sisters who are much older than me because I'm the mistake. Um, and so... <laughs> um, so they, they, they're pretty much like my second and third mother, yeah, um, rather than my actual sisters. And one of them was pregnant in 94, and I was still a baby, so I'm actually closer in age to my niece than I am almost to my sisters. I was a kid at the time, and I would beg my mom to just let me sleep during the day so that I could stay up all night and watch it. And then she'd be like, all right, and then she would stay up all night and watch it, and then my dad would stay up all watching it, and then my other sister was around, and then it would be like, whichever string of boyfriends she would have. It was just the most magical experience. We'd all sit there. Everyone would end up supporting a different team because of something weird, you know. Um, my mom would always support the team with the lowest GDP. <laughs> She'd be like, no, no, you must support them because they, they do this and they do that, you know. <laughs> but secretly she had like a thing for Germany. I don't know why. Um, and then it was so bizarre. We all supported Italy. My sister always supported Portugal because she loved the she loved the goalkeeper, Victor Bahia. So she was always like, oh my God, he's so gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I don't know why she like she's the only one in the family who has a weird accent that doesn't sound English. <laughs> um, and then my older sister would be like walking around with her big belly because she's about to pop. Yeah, and she gave birth at the end of July at the time, and and we and that was my favorite one because it was like the house was just full of always like music and to the extent that the Euros and the World Cup is my favorite experience. It just brought everyone together in the family, right? And that when in 2012, I actually had to travel for the Euros because I started this job, like as in I started being a sports journalist and I got the chance to go to Warsaw and I was crying because all of them were together and I couldn't share in it. I had to just sit there in a stadium and write a report. <laughs> and I was like, this is horrible, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even though I was like witnessing it all for myself. It's such a funny story because I remember talking to, to Dries Mertens when he was at Napoli and he was talking about going to the World Cup in Brazil. And he said, all of my family were like traveling around and staying in like a big house together in Brazil. And they're like moving around the country to go to our games yeah. and with for Belgium. And he was like, I was there with like the Belgian national team. And all I could think the whole time was, I wish I was with my family getting to like go watch the World Cup and be in this house and hang out with everyone. Yeah. Which is super interesting. Like even somebody plays in it was like, oh, that experience of being with your family for a World Cup is such a thing. Yeah, well, you could all be together. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, no, it's exactly that. And I yeah. just kind of felt like even though I was finally living my dream, you know, like it was because before that I was banking and it's really horrible. Like it's really hardcore. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to get into sports journalism was because sport had this magical power of making you like believe in like the right things right like loyalty and team unity mm -hmm. and like you know you could go from hero to zero sorry the other way around zero to hero <laughs> rather than hero to zero and it was just like you know it's just it's one of those like it's a magical thing like in sport you know and you and you get to see like you know the fans of brazil and what they would be wearing and then, and then it was like in japan and when they were in russia and they would be cleaning up after they've watched japan and it was like oh look how they are you know same with one of the, the african countries and and you just, you sort of love that, right? And that, that, that's what you brings you there. But now the way that I view football is very far from that. It's changed. And that's probably why I want to now move to Formula One and take you with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> because that excitement that I have, I just feel like now all I do is discuss horrible things. It was the end of the Euros. I'm like flying high. Donnarumma saves a penalty. And I have to sit there and talk about the racism in England, you know? And I was like, well, just. Or if, even if I celebrate a goal, it's like, well, VAR is checking. And I'm like, no, this is awful. <laughs> you know, There is something that's being sucked out of it in, in world politics. And unfortunately, this is the way of the world now. It's just maybe not as happy as it used to be. It's really hard, isn't it? Because like, when we talk about these things, we all have two things going on, one of which is genuine changes in the world, which there have been like genuine changes in the world and, and things are happening. And it does feel like in global politics right now, everything is awful and everyone is, yeah. is well, I mean, there's literally a war in Europe, which was not a thing that when I was growing up seemed very plausible to happen in our, our lifetime. And, and it's happening right now. Well, that's not true. War in Europe happened, but I suppose a war between 
a war involving a nation as, as big as Russia invading another nation. Yeah, there has been lots of war in Europe in my lifetime, but I suppose this one feels different. Uh, a war with a nuclear power. Because you felt we moved on from these things. You felt that we had, I yeah. don't know, started to choose perhaps Absolutely. peace. There are some massive improvements, obviously, as time has gone on, more peace, more. But then when things do remind you, you, you think what's going on, you know, like, why do we have a war? I get yeah. that. I get that. But then like, there's the other part of it, which is just like our personal nostalgia as well. Because I was thinking mm. about like, so my first memory of football is the 1990 World Cup, very first memory. And really the only memory that I hold on to now is, is the third and fourth game between Italy and England. That's just because it was Italy and England. It was in my house. I had an Italian dad and English mum. And so it was a thing. And that was when I got asked, who are you going to support? And I said, Italy, my brother said England. And I was right. <laughs> but, but it's funny because like that memory is like, I almost remember, I remember the, the sort of the setting. I remember our living room. I remember like talking about who you're going to support. That's what I remember. Whereas the 1994 World Cup, I remember more of the football. The sort of strongest memory for me of that is the final. Yeah. Because we were in my dad's village in Italy, which is a really small village he's from originally in Emilia Romagna up in the hills. And um, basically like someone had got like a big screen in the courtyard of someone, I guess, old fashioned landed gentry in the area had got like, they caught, opened their courtyard up, put a big screen in the middle of it. And watching the final there, and there was a band who'd been playing before the game. And then when the penalties were happening, the drummer was doing a drum roll before each penalty. And I wanted to kill him because I was like, I do not need this drum roll. This drum roll is making things worse. <laughs> and then, and then Italy lost and I cried. Like it was the first time I cried about football for sure. Mm, for mm. sure. The first time I cried about football was, was Italy losing that shootout. And I know like with hindsight, it's really funny because I've seen all these sorts of serious journalistic accounts of First of all, the 1990 World Cup and then the 1994 final. And the consensus in writing seems to be that the 1990 World Cup was terrible. The football was terrible. And the 1994 final was terrible. And I'm not going to go back and watch the 1994 final. I know it was low on chances, but I don't remember it for the football. I remember it for the experience. I remember the feeling of being in that courtyard and, and how intense everything felt and how powerful those emotions were. And. I do remember Masaro missing when through on goal. And I remember, of course, Badjo missing his penalty. And we were in Italy. And the next day, it was all about him getting excommunicated from the Catholic Church because he said he was a Buddhist. It was ridiculous. See, Saki is so bad for football. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's so strange because I, I was heartbroken at the time. You know, I was, I was a kid and you can't like, deal with the complicated emotions of it. And yet now, half a lifetime onwards, when I look back at that, what I think of is like, oh, that moment with my family, you know, my, my dad's not with us anymore, hasn't been since I was a teenager. So like that was one of the sort of, I suppose, last big things we got to do with him as a, as a family. And, and that, that moment feels like a beautiful one, even though it was a sad one. Yeah. And so all these things like our own personal nostalgia, like colors, how we think about, about all sorts of things. But I think for me, football is very wrapped up. World Cups are very wrapped up in those sort of moments of where I was with my family. Because then again, like if I jumped to 2006 um, World Cup final, which of course, a happy memory, Italy win. I could tell you what happens in the game much more vividly because of course I was older, like I remember it better. But what I hold on to from that game isn't specific moments of the game. It's the moment when the last penalty goes in and I was watching it in London with my brother actually. I would have loved to be in Italy, but I was doing my journalism course at the time. I was training to become a professional journalist. I just started taking day shifts at The Guardian, but I was doing some qualifications at the same time. So I was in London. I watched it in a pub with my brother and we were in Soho, which has got quite a good Italian community anyway. And when the last penalty went in, like, I just remember us both like running towards the door and then we're out in the street and we're hugging and there's like cars going by and there's flags and, and there were all these Italians just appeared out of nowhere. And that's what I remember. Like, I can talk to you about the game, but what I remember is that feeling and, and how brilliant it was. 
And like, really, it's it's sharing it with my brother. Like, so for me, the World Cup is like really tied together with feelings of family, I think, actually, when I think about it. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly how I felt about it to the extent that I almost wish I didn't work within it because it stripped me of the very thing that I love the most about it. And weirdly, with Russia, with Italy not going, it was the first time that I could genuinely enjoy a World Cup and not feel like I was there to do work on it, you know? Even mm. when it came to, even with like Champions League finals, like I was so excited at the time to be going to Cardiff to watch Juventus because I really thought that the, this, that that final more than the one against Real Madrid in 2000, no, sorry, against Barcelona in 2015, we had a chance. And it was sort of annoying because it was like a whole, a whole thing, right? All my friends, all of us together to go to the final. But of course, I'm a steady head journalist, you know, and, and you, and you sort of, I'm really sorry, guys, there is like construction all over. So I do apologize if you hear anything coming through. Yeah. So it just really upset me at the time that I was like also working. Because it is what we love so much about football is what it makes us feel, the bonds that we share more than the mm. actual game, right? Because you forget that. You'll, you'll remember like Tele Santana's beautiful football in 1982. You'll remember Baggio was poetry in motion, you know, in, in 94. you remember Toto Scalacci or, or, you know, for me, 86 was actually my, my favorite tournament. Obviously, I, I have no memories of it. I was genuinely like a baby at that point. But we had a video at the time because that was what it was, VHS. And my family had it of all the World Cups. They would always collect them. And that was the one that I watched the most at the time over and over, like much later when I was a grown up and everything. I'd always watched the 86 World Cup because at the time I felt like football was my kind of football. Like it was just mm -hmm. every team had some great star. You know, there was just like Michel Platini. There was like um, Butragueño. There was like, obviously they were all still, a, a, lot, a lot of them were still in 82, but Rummenigge, like loud drop at Denmark. There was just, you know, uh, Francescoli for Uruguay. There was just so much brilliance in each team that you wanted to watch every single side. It's also the first time Iraq had made it into the World Cup. It was just one of those Canada first time. Um, so I love that World Cup a lot. But as in my earliest memory, yeah, 1990, uh, because of the Cornetto song as well, and 94, because of that <laughs> final. <laughs> yeah, the Cornetto song was just, if you guys don't know, Pavarotti, give me one Cornetto. <laughs> um, 98 was the only time that we didn't watch it together as a family because me and my mom and my dad went to the States for summer. And we were in New York uh, when uh, when America was actually taking part. And I just remember being in Fifth Avenue and there's a guy like there was like a group of 70 men running down with the with the flag of Iran because Iran had defeated America. And it was like a whole zeal because of obviously the political. Oh, when you're a kid, you don't know about mm -hmm. these things, you know. And that's, I think, what the World Cup means to people. So it's a shame if they can't be with their families or it's a shame if they can't experience it for what it's supposed to be, which is a time of bringing people together. And instead, it, what we choose to do so often these days is divide them. Oh, it's such a weird thing, isn't it? All these mixed up emotions, I mean, like talking about the good in, in these memories is like makes you feel good about the World Cup again. And then you sort of, it's a really weird World Cup. It just, yeah, maybe it's because we're just older <laughs> and now we're just like, Ugh. yeah, I mean, there is. There is definitely some of that, right? Um, I hope, I really hope that's true, actually. I hope that kids who are 10 years old or whatever are going to watch this World Cup and not deal with any of it and get to grow up and think differently about it because that would be better, really. Let the adults worry about the adult stuff. Mina, should we, I don't know, were there any other nostalgic moments you wanted to revisit or should we have a quick talk about this actual World Cup and who we think is going to do well? What was your favourite song? Oh, World Cup songs. Oh, do you know, it's, it's really hard as an Italian not to think about Un'estate Italiana, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess really like my sort of football songs is like that for the Italian side. And then on the English side, it's not actually a World Cup song. It's Three Lions the first time around in 96 when it was in the Euros. <laughs> the time, I know it's so overplayed now. <laughs> but as a teenager, it was a nice <laughs> moment. It was. It was. It was a nice moment. I defend it. Actually, having, let me ask you a question. Which did you prefer growing up, the Euros or the World Cup? Oh, the World Cup. And I supported Italy more than I did England. Like, it was always true. So, like, yeah. Okay, but, but wait, wait, hold on. What about, because when I think of the Euros, right, I think, uh, like, I, I have much more almost vivid memories. Like, I remember standing outside the hotel really? that Italy stayed in in 96, because it was down the road from where, where, I, where I was living. And my dad was standing with me because I wanted Pierluigi Casaraghi's signature. 
And oh, like when I saw him, I was like one of those like, you know, when they show you sort of like really famous like singers and, you know, and then there's all this crying fans. I was that person. Because of that, you know, like. He was your football crush, wasn't he? I'm allowed to say that, aren't I? Oh, he was such <laughs> my football crush. He was my absolute, I've never had a football crush afterwards. He's been my only one, you know. <laughs> um, I loved him at the time. And that's why I liked Lazio. You know, I thought like I had to support Lazio because he was, obviously he was at Juve, but at the time that I started to like him, he was at Lazio. But 2010, and 2000, actually, the golden goal, that was the first time that I remember football devastated me. That was because oh, in 94, God, was it was like, okay, Baggio skied the penalty and all of that. It was horrible to see. But 2000 was different emotion. Like maybe because I was older and I was like, I, I couldn't get over it. I, I just couldn't. Like I was, I, I think I cried for like a full week. I couldn't, I was miserable waking up in the morning, remembering what had happened. And also because more than anyone who was part of that team, that was such an astonishingly amazing team. It was Toldo. He had like the, the, the euros of his life. He was like the brilliant goalkeeper. And to not have anything to be reminded of that. And it, oh, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible, horrible. I couldn't get over it. I couldn't get over it for the coach, for the people. I had a solid moment of thinking like Tolo's just better than Buffon. He just is, which he yes, wasn't. Like that's the thing. Like he wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't. But like in that, in that game against the Netherlands, like clearly, like most of all, like where he just, just seemed like you just weren't going to get a penalty past him no matter what you did was just extraordinary. Um, and it really felt like it should have been Italy's after that. So Italy should have lost to the Netherlands. They should have. They just weren't as good. Should have lost. But then they, in the final, they were better than France. They were mm, better than France. They so they really should have, were. like, it was, it was all the wrong way around. And that's, yeah. you know, that's football sometimes. But I agree with you. That was a heartbreaking one. It was more heartbreaking than 2002 when I just thought there was, it was just so controversial that I was like, screw this, you know? Yeah. I mean, I suppose to, to talk about Italian football memories and not mention that. Yeah, I remember that because I, um, I, my brother was living in Milan at the time and I was going to spend time with him. And I definitely like expected to watch some World Cup games when I visited him. And then they lost to South Korea right before I went to visit him. And I remember when I was over there, like there was a genuine feeling in Italy at that time, like this is something's going to happen. Italy is going to sue FIFA. Italy's going to like the papers like genuinely it felt like something dramatic was going to come of it, which of course you know, nothing came of it. But there was this feeling of 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 such sincere, like deep outrage, like this cannot stand. And it's funny because when I watch it back now, it's an awful refereeing performance. It's awful. But he also, if he'd really wanted to send someone off, he could have done it before he did. That that needs to be said. Like there were there were some challenges he could have done. And Weirdly, Moreno, who clearly was a very interesting character. I mean, of course, he was arrested later in life for literally smuggling drugs. Like our current referees now, I'm joking. <laughs> I still think when I watch back, when I watch back, the game against Spain is more outrageous. And that's not Moreno. The, the next round when they beat Spain. No, no, no. It was game after game of madness. I remember watching it being yeah. like, I don't know if I even want Italy in this. Also, some really good teams had were all suffered some great injustice at some point, you know? And I just kind of felt mm. at the time, like, I, I'm not into this World Cup. Even though for me, I thought that was the greatest squad ever gone, go like an Italian squad that to go to a World Cup. Oh, yeah. That was on another level, that squad of 2002. It, it was almost like they were old when mm. they were 2006, you know? But... But we have Fabio Cannavaro. Cannavaro, can do you remember that when he like, came out from the bank? Um, in that match, oh, yes. 2006. Oh, oh God, what a great time to be alive! <laughs> Arriva il pallone, lo mette fuori Cannavaro. Poi ancora insiste Podolski. Cannavaro, Cannavaro, il contropiede per Totti. Dentro il pallone per Girardino. Girardino la porta nera anche vicino alla bandierina. Cerca il 1 contro 1. Girardino dentro del Piero. It's sort of funny because this this is not like real time memory. This is like like a memory you plan something afterwards. Because I didn't when I watched the semi final against Germany in two thousand and six. I watched it because again I was doing my journalism course. I watched it in England with English commentary, 
But of course, since then, I've watched the, the, the Italian commentary with Caressa and that is now burned in my memory as if it was my, my real memory of the, of the event, which it wasn't. I saw it on it with English commentary, but now, I mean, it's, it's the most amazing piece of, of commentary, the, the, the grosso goal, because it's just so completely genuine in the moment, losing control commentary. Palla tagliata, messa fuori, c'è Pirlo, 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 ancora Pirlo, di tacco, tiro, God, commentary and music really make such a difference. Like sometimes when you listen to, because I it was like Il, Il Bello della Vita in 98 World Cup. Guys, I'm going to play this because you have to hear it. Come on. Anyway, I used to cry every time the song came on, yeah, and I had played it so much at the time that like none of my friends supported Italy afterwards because they were like, "We hope it loses, so we don't have to listen to that damn song anymore." Um, but yeah, these songs used to make me cry, and my and I and then it made me like there was a song for Denmark that was called "Hot Legs." It was like the worst pop song you'd ever listened to in my like your life, but it was like my favorite song, <laughs> and so Denmark became my second team <laughs> just because I really loved the song at the time. But having this conversation has made me think, maybe I will be able to Formula One. I still really like football. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love talking about football with you, Mina, because every time I talk about football with you, I get excited about it. I genuinely, like, it's like oh, the no. reason we have this podcast is because when I talk football with Mina, I'm always like, oh, I enjoy it. And I think Mina feels the same way. Yes, and so we like, sure. we like doing it together. I am mindful that we said we were not going to make this a super long podcast. And <laughs> oh, I think sorry, we're guys. dangerously slipping towards that territory. But we have time for more nostalgia. We can do more nostalgia as we go. But let's just have a very, very quick talk about the tournament that's coming up. Obviously, Italy aren't in it. That's it. That's all you need to know, guys. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Who cares? <laughs> who, who you got, Mina? Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Who's good? Let's just, let's just do a real quick who's going to win and then Dark Horses and then we can call it there. Okay, well, our podcast producer is saying Australia. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. <laughs> like, I don't know. Imagine if Australia does do something special. I don't know. I don't think it will go according to plan like everyone thinks it do, It will. Like, Do you remember when like, Mexico were ruining Germany in the last World Cup? And I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? And Japan was like yeah. having the, a, a field day against Belgium that everyone considers to always think is the best team that never does anything. Yeah. Although they did do pretty well in that one. I, it really upset me that Sadio Mane had, is out for Senegal because I would have liked them to have like a good shout at it. I guess you would say Brazil and Argentina, but then I don't know. I'm just not that confident of... They seem to be very well stacked in going forward or at the back, but perhaps not all such greatly stacked in midfield, which I always think is the most important. Um, I think Serbia could do something special. Yeah, if they all work together, I think it's a nice team. I always think Croatia is a great team. You would think France, but again, I think they're missing some really important players. So I don't know how this is all going to work out for them. But when you have Mbappe, you have like the secret code to everything in life. So I yeah. guess it's them, right? Like it's, it's France, it's probably Spain, because let's be honest, if there's one game that I didn't think Italy should have won in the Euros was the one against Spain. Um, even though I was yeah, totally happy it happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess Spain, France, Portugal, I think, looked like a, a pretty decent team. Brazil and Argentina. But I still don't think, I don't know, I, I feel like there's going to be a dark horse in there and it won't be any of the ones that we think it will be. Yeah, I'm sort of inclined to agree. There's a part of me that thinks it'll be Argentina just some way, somehow, because Messi's going to win because one. Like, it's just like, this is like, it's going to happen. Messi will win a World Cup. I know, you know, he's not the Messi of a few years ago, but he's played pretty well recently. And and Messi will do Messi things that last at a World Cup and, and they'll win one. But I think if I go through it in like my sort of like trying to be more rational mind, I think Spain like the team that have shown me on an international level that they can play the best team football I over agree. and over again. They should have won the Euros, really. 
yeah. they were better than Italy. Italy just got in their heads and, and won that game of football. But Spain sort of reasserted who's better, I think, when they played in the Nations League. Spain are probably the best team in Europe right now and therefore have a good shot. Brazil have got some really sort of impressive depth of options as well. I think Brazil, my problem with Brazil is that when push comes to shove, not that I don't think he's very talented, I just don't believe in Neymar. And I think that's really like a dividing line between whether or not I think they can win. Like I just on some level don't believe in him and and maybe he'll prove me wrong. What do you feel of Argentina with Argentina's midfield? Because when you look at it, do you not think to yourself, how is this going to be enough? Like with Paredes considering his form and... Definitely. I don't think that Argentina squad looks that strong to me overall. And and most of what I'm hanging on is, like I said, Messi. it's it's a 35-year-old Leo Messi. They've got... Well, obviously it's not really just about him. I mean, if, if, if you get the good Lautaro, who he's been pretty um, productive at, at international level. His goal scoring record at international level is strong. If you get him, if you get Angel Di Maria... Again, playing his better football if you get... Romero at the back, defending. Grimace at the foot, but you get Dybala showing up in a good way instead of a bad way. If you get... I'd love it, of course, because I love him. But if you get magical Atalanta Papu Gomez a few years ago, there's a lot of attacking options. But you're right, there's no real balance in midfield. And a lot of those players I've just named... Do I really have faith in Dybala? No, I think he's got talent. But do I believe in him to to be the one who wins the World Cup? Not really. And that's why I'm sort of saying... It's, it's just because of like this idea of the, the messy effect. And I do think international football is strange like that because teams have less time together and perhaps even more so with this World Cup with the short lead up time. I think individual performance does, that, does carry a team even more than in club football. I think yeah. when you've got a star who can really make a difference because the teams are less well organized overall, it, it can. But I think that's why I said Spain is my um, actual pick. Dark horses, I just want to sort of throw out, it is a really dark horse. I don't know if I can really see them winning it, but I I think uh, we talked about them earlier. What if this is a tournament where South Korea could go far? Maybe I'm just too hyped up on the Kim Min Jae at Napoli season and maybe Sun stops playing as disappointingly as he has for Tottenham most of the season. And- I love Sun. I love, you never know, actually. That's my dark horse. It is a dark horse. I'm a proper dark horse. Sometimes it's just nice when it's like a a different team than the ones that you expect. And it's just kind of like a breath of fresh air when, I don't know if you remember that moment of the World Cup where where obviously um, Luis Suarez saves it with his hand against Ghana and then they miss the penalty. I I do remember it. (laughs) Yeah. And and I remember like my mom acted as if someone just shot her. She like fell to the ground. She's like, no, because she really wanted Ghana to win. Yeah. I was like, I don't know how to explain. I felt so much of everything that Luis Suarez has felt. You know, when you see your team lo- losing and like a goal about to go in and you just do everything to, to stop it, you know? And I was like, yeah. And yeah. then they just instinctively ended up being like a Uruguay supporter, you know, at that moment. But it was, yeah, it was just nice to have a game in which like you got to see different players or or just to support something else. Because I, I feel like I'm, so, I'm sort of a little bored of all of it, always being like Ronaldo and Messi and Neymar and Mbappe. And, and I like it when you have like, like James Rodriguez had his moment, do you remember? And everyone like he shot to fame. I like these types of like games where you start to get to know about other players and, and who shines. And yeah, I, I do. I do hope that, I don't know, a South Korea emerges or something happens or we see a team that, you know, Mexico stuns us again. Um, otherwise, it's going to be all same, same. But unfortunately, it is where the great players are. And so I, I guess that's what we're all expecting to see. Brazil, Argentina, France, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, it should have been Italy. <laughs> I know. Do you think Italy would have won it? Why don't we end on... Yeah, I was about to go <laughs> to the same place. Do you think Italy would have won it? I don't think they would have won it, but I think that... I think they would be one of the... I think they'd be a real contender if they were there. I think they... I'm not saying they'd be the favourites because they wouldn't be, but I think they'd be in the group of maybe seven or eight teams who could win this tournament if they'd been there, which is sort of ridiculous then to not have got there. You know, we didn't mention England. I mean, England have like a such a stacked squad. Like when I think of them, I just think like their midfield's pretty nice. Like I really like Declan Rice. I really like Jude Bellingham. You know, I love Mason Mount. I I think Harry Kane is a brilliant forward. The only thing is like your centre backs, right? Because they left all the good ones behind. So um, mm-hmm. I I just think, and obviously, like obviously, it's really it's a shame to lose Reese James and and to lose Ben Chilwell because they would have made that the perfect backline, you know. 
But I think it's a great team. The thing that I doubt about them as well is Southgate. Because otherwise, I think that if this team in the hands of oh, Carlo Ancelotti would have won the damn Cup World Cup, no? I, I agree with you. I think it's it's really hard because being in England, there's this tendency to overhype England. Mm. And I think, I, I sometimes feel like I sort of instinctively underhype them. But you, you're right. If you go through that team player for player, I think there's very few countries that you would say are clearly better than them. Yeah. This time I can honestly say that. The defence is the weakest part of it. Mm. But yeah, when you've got Harry Kane, who's been extremely consistently able to put the ball in the net at international level as well as at club level, and then you've got players behind him like Mason Mount, when you've got players who are coming through even this season, taking another big step forward, I think Bukayo Saka has been brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. There is a lot in that team to get excited about. There's just a big part of you that expects them to be England because it's England at an international tournament. But no, I, I think that the, the squad is, is is really talented for sure. You can't call them a dark horse. No. Like they're, 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 they've got too much sort of high value, top tier talent in that team to call them that. But are they a contender? Yes. I think they'll reach at least the quarterfinals. They should. And then will they England it up is the big question really at that point. I, I, I really, I do look at that team and I really struggle to see how many are better as a squad. Like, as in, I know everyone talked about the golden generation mm. with Gerard and Lampard, and, and I still think that this, you know, the squad is even better. Um, I don't know if they all integrate well enough because I don't feel like Southgate really knows how well they all play individually and what suits them in their roles. Because Foden is suited better to what the way Manchester City play than the way that Southgate wants to play with England, for example. So is he going to have the same effect, you know? But otherwise, I look at that and mm. man for man, if I go through it, I think it's a, it's a pretty great team. You know, like what a shame if they don't reach it. Whereas I have lots of question marks about so many other sides. Like who's going to score the goals for Spain? Because you're relying on Morata to have one, one of those good days. I think he's a superb yeah. foot forward, but not necessarily the most clinical. So, you know, and, you, and then you worry about Germany in, in other ways too, because they have a habit nowadays of not being as consistent as they were before. So, yeah, I, I look at England and I think you, you have a better chance than most. So try not to England it up. I think it's about time to wrap things up. I want to say one last thing, which is for anyone who is listening to this or has been feeling conflicted about the World Cup, not sure they want to watch it. Just bear in mind, there is still other football you can watch. Um, Serie A Feminile, the women's uh, league is going this weekend. Yes. Uh, interesting season, actually. Juventus are not top for once. Juventus have won the league, I think, five seasons in a row. Roma are top at the moment. They've got a few teams ahead of them. Serie B also carrying on. So there is still football if you choose not to like the World Cup. It's our job. We're going to be watching the World Cup as well. But don't despair football. Football continues and uh, we'll still be here doing this show uh, through the World Cup. Mina, I should throw it to you to, to close. I, I just wanted to say that as well. well we're going to try to do this. I don't know. When do you think we should do this next one, guys? Maybe at the start of the one the World Cup actually starts. And uh, we'll keep you informed on Twitter. Please do follow us at Serie A Pod. Obviously, at Nikki Bandini, at Mina Rizuki. Thank you to all for listening to our Patreon subscribers. And we will come back to you with our thoughts on the World Cup with and keep you abreast of all the news that is still happening in Italy. Ciao for now and thanks for listening.
Social Podcast Network. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.